Welcome back, Tea Cats. Dylan here from Woo Mountain Tea. In chapter seven today, we are tracing the history of tea back from its humble origins in ancient China all the way around the world across time to where it stands today. I absolutely love this topic because when you gain an understanding of the history and the culture of tea around the world over time, you truly gain a new perspective and a new appreciation of the experience of drinking tea, and it makes it just that much more enjoyable. Now, to start things off, as I I do with every chapter, I'm going to give you the one sentence summary of all the content we'll be covering today in chapter seven, a little framework to have in the back of your mind as we move forward with this chapter. Tea was first discovered in ancient China for its energizing and medicinal properties. Became popularized throughout East Asia during the Chinese Tang and Song dynasties spread west during the age of exploration, and today stands as the world's most consumed beverage after water due to its flavor, cultural significance, and health benefits. Next, we are going to expand on the sentence, explore the crucial details, and just catapult you out of this video with a crystal clear understanding of the history and the culture of tea as it has evolved and spread over time. The discovery of tea is attributed to the semi-mythical Chinese emperor named Shen Nong. And Shen Nong was the emperor of China around 2737 BC. So we are talking ancient, ancient China. And it was at this time that he had decreed that all of the inhabitants of his empire must boil their water before drinking it. He saw that uh, when you boil the water first, his subjects were far less sick. He had mandated, you gotta boil the water before you drink it. So legend has it. He's sitting near a forest, boiling his water in a kettle. And a big gust of wind comes and it blows the leaves off of a nearby tea plant. And it floats through the air and lands in his boiling kettle. Thus, you have the first cup of tea. He drinks the tea, likes the flavor, and he notices that it has this energizing, invigorating property to it. Probably Shenlong had a little caffeine buzz going, or perhaps was experiencing that synergistic effect of L-theanine and caffeine that we've been talking about throughout this masterclass. So he experiences the flavor and the energy provided by tea, and he says, Tea gives vigor to the body, contentment to the mind, and determination of purpose. So needless to say, Shenlong immediately loves tea, and he decides that everybody in his empire needs to be drinking tea. So at that point, tea starts to be planted on a relatively small scale all over ancient China at that time. We're not cultivating tea on a large commercial scale yet, but tea is on the map, so to speak, and we have people starting to cultivate tea here and there and drink tea for these medicinal and energizing properties starting in 2737 BCE. Tea slowly just spreads through ancient China from one one village to the next village. And so the next big blip on the radar of tea history doesn't come until the Tang and Song dynasties, which go from the 7th to the 13th century AD. At this time, China was the epicenter of human civilization in the world. There was a great dynasty before this, the Han dynasty, but that was kind of rivaled with the Roman Empire of the time. This was around 200 BC to about 200 AD. And the greatness of the Han Dynasty kind of overlapped with the Roman Dynasty. And you could argue that both of those were equally sophisticated and relevant and had comparable achievements. But the Tang and Song from the 7th century through the 13th century was unparalleled and unrivaled in human civilization at that time, right? This was the dark ages of Europe. So for this period of like four to 500 years, 
Tang and Song China was the center for politics, commerce, philosophy, arts. This is when the Silk Road emerges and you have goods coming and going from China. You have the flourishing of poetry and pottery and painting and all these amazing advancements in human civilization. You have the invention of a lot of new technologies, the compass and really advanced sail, sailboats and ships that were allowed to navigate and trade over sea. And so what was happening at this time was that China being the center had all of these neighboring countries and regions around it. So you have Japan, Korea, Vietnam at the time, towards Tibet. You have all of these kind of satellite nations sending emissaries and ambassadors and scholars to go to China and live there and pay tribute to the government, but also to study and to learn Buddhist scriptures and philosophy of Tang and Song China. So this is the context of the Tang and Song. Now, in the eighth century, we have arguably the biggest event in tea history take place. For Christians, it's comparable to the birth of Christ or to biologists, this might be equivalent to like the publication of On the Origin of Species by Darwin. What happened was the writing and publication of what's called the classic of tea or the Cha Jing by Lu Yu. Lu Yu was a 8th century Tang Dynasty philosopher, uh, scholar, poet, and essentially at this time tea has started to be consumed just by the elite class. So you have wealthy merchants, priests, and kind of like the political aristocracy drinking tea. And these wealthy merchants who are trading tea wanted kind of, essentially they wanted a masterclass about tea. They wanted some type of publication about tea, so something written down. Because until this point, it wasn't official. It wasn't formal. These merchants commissioned Lu Yu to write the classic of tea. And the classic of tea goes through all things related to tea cultivation, the right types of tea to pluck, how to pluck the tea, how to brew the tea, what types of water to use, what temperatures, all the tea tools that were commonly used at the time. Before Lu Yu, they were adding all types of other herbs and things into the boiling tea in the kettle, but Lu Yu was like, take all that other stuff out of the tea. He makes this incredible guide and it's fascinating because a lot of modern scientific research on tea today is actually verifying and giving scientific evidence to support some of the observations that Lu Yu made in eighth century Tang Dynasty China. He observed that the best water to use was mountain spring water as opposed to you know, well water, for instance. And then in modern science, they're finding that it's the spring water that has these specific properties that are more beneficial for extracting flavor and these various compounds from tea than something like well water. So basically, Lu Yu writes this really sophisticated guide on tea, the first masterclass on tea. This puts tea on the map in such a big way. It, it makes it official. It makes it this formal, recorded, kind of transmissible art form for the first time in history. But in the Tang Dynasty, it's still only at the elite kind of upper classes that are drinking tea regularly. Now we move along a little bit into the Song Dynasty and the prosperity and the achievements and greatness of the Tang Dynasty is continued through into the Song Dynasty. And what you have happening here is that the population of China at this time just bubbles up. The economy is great. There's a lot going on. Civilization is stable. So the population grows significantly. What ends up happening is that a lot of the grain, the rice mostly, but the food that would be used to feed that growing population, a lot of it was being used for alcohol production. It was used to make like rice liquor and rice wine. And the government with these growing population pressures, they were starting to run out of food and they needed to feed the people. So they made this mandate at the time in the, in the Song Dynasty where they forced people to stop using all these food supplies for alcohol production so that it could be used to feed people in place of alcohol as the drink of choice for the commoner, they promoted tea. So tea became promoted by the government as a beverage that would allow them to use more grain for food production. And so obviously the government starts mandating more tea plantations to crop up. You have tea pushed out on a large scale for the first time because the government had this pressure to feed the people and they were gonna do that by giving them something else to drink besides grain-based alcohol. With the movement of tea from a small amount of wealthy elite class people drinking it to a large scale plantation crop, now you have way, way more people able to drink it. The supply goes way up, the demand goes up, and you have tea houses popping up all over towns and cities. You have artists 
and philosophers and everyday people coming together and meeting at tea houses in Song, China to chat and to talk politics and to have conversations about life. So for the first time you have tea integrated into everyday life. Now at the same time, remember what we said about Tang and Song dynasty China before, which is that all these neighboring countries were sending people to China to engage in politics and to learn and to study there. It's in this Tang and Song period that you have tea seeds taken back to Japan and Korea for the first time and tea plantations start in those countries. And you have the establishment of like the tea horse road, which is this tea trade route established with the Tibetan region where the Chinese would trade tea with the Tibetans for horses because the peoples in that frontier region, their diets were mostly only like yak and, and fatty animal products. They realized that when they started incorporating tea into their everyday diet, they had way less heart attacks and cardiovascular issues. Those people started drinking tea and trading with China for tea. You even have tea going as far as the Middle East at this point, right? Over that Silk Road trade route. So you have some Middle Eastern culture starting to have tea drinking traditions crop up at this time as well. So you really have like a massive radius around China and within China, up and down the socioeconomic ladder, starting to drink tea seriously, starting the Tang, but really in the Song Dynasty is where it takes off. So now we are getting towards the end of the 13th century. And if you have studied Asian history, you know what happens at the end of the 13th century. Cue the Mongolians, because they are coming in hot at the end of the 13th century. They really put a stop to everything real quick, and they come in and basically take over all of China, almost all of Asia, most of the Middle East, and a massive chunk of Europe for like 100 years. This was the largest human empire to ever exist, actually. The Mongolian Empire kind of puts a wet blanket over the spread and flourishing of tea culture for about a years. The Mongolian rule doesn't stomp it out per se, but you know, there's not big innovations or new things happening with tea for about a hundred years. But soon we have the reemergence of Chinese civilization with the Ming dynasty. And you have a flourishing of all this new innovation in the world of tea. You have clay teapots, you have gaiwans in small cups made and used for tea consumption for the first time in history, right? A lot of the tea wares and teas that we still use today were invented first in the Ming Dynasty. I kind of think of this as like the early modern period of tea. It's the first time where a lot of what we would recognize as modern tea drinkers today starts to emerge. And, and like I said, certain teas, for instance, black tea and oolong tea, it's thought the processing of those half oxidized and oxidized teas emerged during the Ming Dynasty. And it's also at this time where they're using whole tea leaves to prepare the tea. Before this in the Tang and Song, they were either boiling it, right, in the Tang, and then in the Song, they were crushing it into powder and whisking it into a bowl. And in the Ming, they're using whole tea leaves to drink tea in teapots just like this, and in teacups just like this, the same way I am doing and maybe you are doing right now. Okay, so now we are creeping into the 15th and 16th centuries, and that's about when the rascally Europeans come and ruffle everybody's feathers. The Portuguese and Dutch traders, they come in hot on their trading sea vessels. They arrive in China and they see this whole world of brand new products they have never seen before. They see silk, they see porcelain, they see tea. And tea is just kind of another one of the Chinese specialty goods that they throw on their ships and take back to Europe and try to sell. When one of these Portuguese trade ships comes back to Europe, we have the Princess of Portugal, Catherine of Braganza. She gets her hands on some Chinese tea and she absolutely loves it. She ends up marrying Charles II of England. She lands at Portsmouth in England. She hops off the ship for her new life as British royalty. And her famous first words as she's walking off the ship is, I want tea. Girl, I have been there. So what she ends up doing in the British aristocracy is that she popularizes tea there, right? She's a trendy lady. She's drinking tea in, in the high court of England. She's doing it so it looks cool and it kind of catches on with that, with that higher class. Then, you know, the upper middle class sees them and they're like, ooh, I wanna be fancy like them and drink tea. So they start getting their hands on some tea. Then the middle class sees the upper middle class doing it. And they're like, ooh, I wanna be fancy like them, right? The demand for tea slowly spreads down through all of English society. 
And you know, the same general trend is happening in all of Western Europe at this time, but it's particularly notable in England, right? Everybody knows the English love their tea. This is really the hotbed of tea spreading in the West and in, in Western Europe in general. You know, now we're moving to the 16th, 17th centuries, creeped into early 18th century. Trade now at this point is just flowing back and forth from Europe to China. You know, it's not the early Dutch and Portuguese explorers anymore. It's like serious trade routes have been established tons and tons of ships are going back and forth. So that makes it so with this increasing demand in tea, these trading companies can keep up with demand. They just send more ships to China and start getting more and more and more tea to bring back to England. And actually this includes the Americas, well, at least North America, right? So we're in the 1700s now, you go to places like New York or Philadelphia, you'll see tea houses popping up through the 1700s. At this time, obviously this, the United States were still colonies of England and you have the big no-no committed by England, which is raising taxes on the colonists' tea. They did not like that. Basically, they protested. They threw all the tea chests of, of England's tea vessel into the Boston Harbor and they proceeded to start a revolutionary war because of how discontent they felt about their tea taxes. So that goes to show you how deeply and how seriously tea had become integrated already into these Western nations by the early mid 1700s. I actually draw an analogy to how tea moves down the socioeconomic ladder in Song Dynasty, China. You have tea moving from from the aristocracy down to the middle and working classes. And the same thing that happened in Song Dynasty China happens in New York and London with the flourishing of these tea houses where people meet and talk politics and you know smoke their pipes and talk about the news and artists will go there. It's a hotbed for discussion and public discourse. And actually one of the fascinating things that I learned when I was researching this chapter in London, tea replaced gin as like the morning and afternoon drink of choice. And the same thing happened in New York with ale. Tea replaced ale as the preferred morning and afternoon beverage of choice. And you'll remember from Song Dynasty China, right? Tea also replaced rice liquor and rice wine. I just thought it was hilarious that before tea came along, the status quo for the societies of these huge nations was to wake up, roll out of bed and start drinking beer or gin or rice wine. It took the advent and the spread of tea consumption to convince people that maybe the best idea wasn't to wake up and immediately start drinking all day long. Okay, so now we are in the 1800s. We are moving on into the age of imperialism, which is not humanity's finest hour, but nonetheless, tea spreads considerably at this time. The British take tea from China. They manage to smuggle some tea plants out of China and they plant it at a massive commercial scale in their colonies in India, Sri Lanka, and Kenya. That's throughout the 1800s. Now, basically not a whole lot more changes. At this time, we have the whole leaf tea consumption habit. We have our teapots, our teacups, our tea wares, our porcelain, gaiwans, etc. Not a whole lot changes. The world changes quite a bit. Have a couple of world wars. We hug and make up for the most part. The next big blip on the radar, in my opinion, comes around the year 2000. And actually there's two blips right around this time. So the first big blip, I call it the Pu'er blip. Around the late 90s and early 2000s, someone you know, made the observation that Pu'er improves in quality and the flavor is enhanced through aging, which makes it a product that can attain more value over time. So people start investing in Pu'er and the price just kind of skyrockets and you have this huge bubble in pricing which pops at some point, but you know, the prices since then recovered if not surpassed what it ever was and the pu'er industry has never really turned back. Pu'er tea has become this high value luxury item in China and that idea has kind of spread around the whole world, which you know, some of it's just glamour and glitz and sales and, and marketing tricks and stuff like that, but some of it I think is, is definitely warranted. I mean really good aged pu'er is fantastic. It's so good and I think that a lot of it's actually worth the price that's being charged for it right now. Some of the stuff's way overpriced, but you know, anyway, so that's a whole different conversation. But the idea is that tea really blows up. The image is modernized and kind of changed into this really premium product. Now the second blip I'm calling like the superfood blip. 
kind of. We'll keep that as a tentative name for now, but basically the idea is that starting in the 90s and in through the 2000s, you have tons of research, mostly in Japan, about these really unique health effects of the polyphenols and catechins that are in tea leaves, right? Mostly EGCG. They're starting to see that it, ha it could play a role in cancer prevention or reducing the severity of all of these chronic diseases. We're finally having scientific evidence for age old wisdom that tea is really healthy for you. And at the same time, you have people getting really health conscious. You have like gym memberships and like supplement shops and all these fitness programs kind of starting to blow up. You have people talking about superfoods and biohacking and optimizing health and people want to get their hands on these food products that have really beneficial properties. This is a big trend in the West to grow through the 2000s and into today, right? You have places like Whole Foods popping up. Then you take the fact that it's trendy to try like new things from different cultures and boom, you have matcha just exploding. And then don't mention the fact that it looks great on your Instagram reel. How hip am I with my matcha latte? I'm healthy and I'm trending. Hashtag matcha. In the West, in the recent one or two decades, tea has started to take off again because it's healthy, delicious, and it's a really interesting culture and history behind it, which is exactly what we're talking about right now. And that basically brings us to me and you on YouTube talking about tea so that we can learn about this really interesting plant and how to prepare it and what are the health benefits and what is the history of this really unique plant leaf. So basically that gets us caught up to today. The title of the video is 2737 BCE to today. We started with the Shanong and we have come all the way to 2022. In the comment section below, I wanna know what parts of tea history are you interested in and want me to cover more in the future with future videos. Stick around for chapter eight. That is the last and final chapter of the masterclass on tea. And we are talking about current tea industry issues that we face today and will continue to face and must navigate through into the future. This is an absolutely critical, critical topic if you wanna be a conscious and aware tea drinker. The tea industry is not perfect. We do have things that we have to figure out. There are problems and the ones that we're gonna be talking about in chapter eight pertain directly to the environment, environmental health, and human health. As a consumer or a producer or whatever, wherever you are in the world of tea, it's our responsibility as modern drinkers to be aware of what's happening in the tea world, right? We've come 5,000 years, and if we want another 5,000 good years of tea growing and drinking and enjoyment, then we have to be smart about navigating through this critical time in the history of tea, because the history of tea hasn't stopped. It goes on through today and into tomorrow. That's it for chapter seven. If you like this video, give me a like, a subscribe would be fantastic. More than anything else, I want you to stay healthy, stay positive and keep sipping tea.